All right, welcome uh, to the second week of our domestic coaching clinics. Thanks for tuning in. Um, and thanks to everyone that jumped on last week. It was a good starting point with um, Jackie and, and, um, and Jared's presentations and looking forward to building on it tonight with Billy and Emily. Um, so thanks for, for jumping on board. Thanks for getting into it. I forgot to mention it last week. If you have questions throughout, just shoot them through to me. I'll ask at the appropriate time. But we want some engagement. We don't want to be, you know, completely just a lecture where you sit back and uh, talk to the whole time. If you've got questions, you've got things, um, let's try and um, shoot them through so we can, we can bring them up. Other than that, I will hand over to our first presenter, which is Emily Harmon, who is um, presenting on some skills and drills and hopefully give some really good ideas um, on the things that you can take to your audience practice once we start back up, hopefully not too soon. All you, Em. Got it. Hey, guys. Um, yep, yeah, so as Reese mentioned, um, we'll be talking about some skills and drills today. Um, I'm pretty passionate about skills and drills. Um, if, and as Reese mentioned, if you have any questions throughout this, do not hesitate to ask because um, I could talk about it for days. Um, but we'll get, we'll jump into it. So I'm just going to share my screen. I'm not the most technologically advanced person. So this, let me know if this works, Reese. Host disabled. Try again, try again. Yeah. Sorry. That's all good. Yeah, all good. Yep. Um, so a couple of things. So before we get into the skills and drills, um, just go over a couple of things. So when introducing these skills and drills, there's, um, you know, a few different styles of learning, which you all would hear about. But it's really important, I think, in youth development to understand, um, you know, there's the old wise tale that your best athletes or your, your leaders on your teams are always the ones who kind of jump into first the, the drill or the skill. Um, I don't necessarily think that's true. I think everyone has different styles of learning. Um, like for me personally, and I've had to grow in this area is I'm, I'm a hands-on person. So if somebody can tell me something and I might get it when it comes to doing it, I need to see it. Um, so it's really important to understand that on a team of 10 kids, all you're gonna have visual learners, you're gonna have auditory learners, you're gonna have kinesthetic learners. So you need to really cover the basis of them seeing it, hearing it, and then doing it. So when I introduce uh, in my programs a new drill or a skill, you know, I talk them through it. I explain what we're doing. Um, I show it where we walk through it. Okay. And then we jump into it and we do it. So it, you know, it doesn't really, it sounds like it takes a lot of time, but it doesn't take a lot of time. And that way, you know, everyone, by the time you start the drill should have a pretty solid understanding of what you're about to do. Um, a few points of emphasis when doing these drills. Um, the first one is keep players active. So, it's, you know, it'd be great if every kid on your team had, had their own basketball. That way everyone has something to do. That's not always the case. Um, if you're doing a drill like dribbling lines where you've got different lines across the baseline or the sideline, instead of having two lines with five kids in it or three lines with, you know, four kids in each line, try and separate it as much as you can so the kids stay active and engaged. So I always like to go with at least five lines, two to three kids in those lines. That way they're not standing there for long periods of time. So especially at the domestic age level, it really helps the kids stay engaged with what you're doing. Um, the second point, let kids know the why behind the skill and the drill that they're learning. So kids are a lot smarter than what we give them credit for. Um, they don't wanna do something just to do it. Right, let them know why they're doing it. Um, a few of the drills that I'll go through in a little bit. One is dribbling a basketball while tossing a tennis ball. Okay, kid wants to know why. Why am I doing this? Okay, in a, in a game, I don't have a tennis ball. Fair enough, good question. It's in, but in a basketball game, you have to be able to do more than one thing at one time. So even, even asking kids, you know, a simple math question while they're dribbling, what's two plus two? You know, can they think? and can they dribble, you know, uh, but let them know why you're doing it. Um, third point, using key terms, points of emphasis, you want them to remember. So this really helps kids 
incorporate what they're learning and training um, and bring it to the game. So an important bit of that is, you know, do they know parts of the floor? If you're saying, um, go to the split line, do they, do they know what the split line is? Um, if you're saying free throw line extended, do they understand what that is? When you say, you know, to the key or to the elbow, um, 45 degree, you know, these are things that you want to reiter reiterate and practice so that they understand, yeah, this is a point of emphasis. I need to lock this in my brain. Um, you know, and stuff like your defensive drills. Do they understand a key point like high eye or low eye? It takes a long sentence of explaining it to a point of emphasis where they can register, yep, I know what that means. So really, you know, when you're giving them these drills, let them know what you want them to take away from it. Um, fourth point, have a plan and write it down before training. So never go into a training um, and, just, and just wing it. Like I'm a big planner, and that might not necessarily be your thing, but um, I think that is important, especially again, with the domestic age level, is to keep them all engaged, to keep them all active, to keep them all, yep, we're doing boom, 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 boom. They know if you have a plan or if you don't have a plan. Um, and then also be willing to adjust that plan, especially with kids, you know? They might be on it one day, and then and the next day that same drill isn't gonna work. You have to be able to give and take a little bit, like, yeah, this isn't working. I'm not gonna keep trying and pushing it. I'm gonna move on. We'll come back, back to it another time. Um, which brings me to point five, which is keep your drills short and sharp. So if you have a half hour practice, a 45 minute practice, even an hour practice, you shouldn't really be spending more than 10 minutes on the same um, drill. Now, the same skill you can in different drills, but don't be so stuck on a single drill. And again, that goes back to keeping kids engaged, um, keeping them you know, on task. Sometimes it's, it's time to move on. And that's, that's the other bit of that is, you know, you have to be prepared to move on. If, it's, if, it's, if the drill is still ugly, if they haven't quite got the skill, you know, you've introduced it, they're learning it, come back to it, keep going, move on to something else because you'll lose their attention like that. Um, point six, make drills competitive. So going back to, yep, in a training, I'm gonna introduce a skill, we're gonna practice that skill, but now I'm gonna incorporate that skill into some sort of competitive game. Um, by making drills competitive, kids are, immediately working substantially harder without even really realizing it. Um, this isn't just kids, this is, you know, anyone. As soon as you make something competitive, you know, there's always that extra bit of energy, that extra bit of um, effort. Um, and then again, this is how they transform bad habits into good habits. So you can spend your training just walking through shooting form, which is great because kids need to understand proper shooting form. But as soon as you introduce it into a game and they catch the ball, they're right back to their bad habits of throwing the ball at the ring. Um, so they need to learn, yes, how to shoot, how to use that form, but then they need to know how to implement it into a faster pace, into a game-like pace. And it's just fun, you know, especially at this age level. Basketball is very much about having fun. Um, and everyone likes to compete, it's fun. Um, just a few of the necessary skills, because obviously there's a whole bunch of basketball skills out there. Um, so how do you break down what at that age level, what your kids should be learning in your training sessions. Um, obviously, you want to um, cover the basic ball handling moves. So they need to be able to keep their dribble. They need to be able to understand not traveling. They need to understand basic crossover moves. Um, can I retreat out of something and keep my dribble? So, I mean, ball handling at this age, you know, harp at home. Um, shooting technique is another huge one. Passing basic cuts to get open, um, defense, and not so much with defense, it doesn't necessarily have to be five on five, as much as understanding correct defense, defensive form, like playing low, moving your feet, sliding, um, one-on-one, -on -one. can I stop someone one-on-one, -on -one? understanding a screen. So it's, it's a little bit more about, I think, individual defense as well, and not just 100% about five on five, obviously that's important but you need to be able to learn, your, le learn how to move your feet in order to be good at that five on five defense. Um, so, oh, where'd it go? Small sided games, which kind of goes with that last point. Um, 
2v2 and 3v3, I think, are really um, important types of small-sided games you can run and not just do five on five the whole time. Um, I think 2v2 and 3v3, you can really break down, here's how you guard a screen, here's how you come off a screen. Um, you can harp home on some of those skills that you've worked through the whole training, and it's very obvious if the kids understand it or not in those smaller-sided games. Um, and the last one is athletic development, something that often gets overlooked because um, you expect kids just to be able to understand athletic development. But if you tell them to bend over and touch the ground, you know, they can't put their fingers past their knees. So um, being able to skip, being able to jump, set up a ladder. Can they run through the ladders? Can they move their feet? Don't avoid this stuff, especially at this age level. Like if you're starting your practice out, um, ladders are a great tool, you know, to can they move their feet quickly? Can they jump on one leg? It sounds silly, but can they? Um, you'd, be, you'd be shocked that how many aren't very good at it. And, and teaching that, that really drives home, okay, a layup is done off of one leg, okay? So it really goes hand in hand, and it's often overlooked. And we'll go into some different drills and skills now. Um, so one of the ball handling drills, and again, we have a resource library um, on our Wyndham website, and it's a great one. I encourage you to go and look at it if you haven't already, um, but we'll try. So this is, we threw this together quickly before um, the shutdown so that kids could have a few different challenges to work on at home. So we'll go ahead and watch this one. I hope it works. Maybe. Maybe stop sharing your webcam for a second. Yep. Just turn your video off. Mm -hmm. Might help. It's loading. Here we go. Ah. We'll start it. See if we can drag it back. So that was a couple of our, let me turn my screen back on. A couple of videos there that we put together. I don't know how clear it was for you guys, but again, that's, that's all up on our um, website under player resources. So again, I really like the tennis ball um, combination with the ball handling. It makes kids focus on two things at once, which is what basketball is. Um, a couple of different things that we do with the tennis ball is the, the tennis ball toss, which is what you saw in that video, tossing it back and forth with your partner. Um, again, you can make it competitive where they start on the baseline and they move with it to half court and back who makes it first. or so who can go to 10 catches without dropping the tennis ball. Um, you know, there's always ways to make it competitive. Um, this tennis ball chase one is a fun one for the kids. So 
the way that that works is the partner in front is dribbling their basketball and the partner behind tosses it over their shoulder or rolls it between their feet and they have to chase the tennis ball down while keeping their dribble um so this works on the kids keeping their dribble but also can they um drop low with their dribble as well so it makes them not stand straight up um, as they're dribbling it but they've got to be able to bend down get low and keep that dribble going um then you have your normal dribble lines like i said try and spread that out don't have two lines with five kids in it um even in it and spread it out as much as you can to keep everyone engaged um, and we'll send this through to you guys so you can have a better look at it after this and this is another one um, i really like to implement more than one skill into something. So, you know, here you have your zigzag ball handling. So introducing crossover moves at these cones. Um, you could also introduce some retreat dribbles um, into a crossover move. But then after you get to half court, now it's full speed ahead, um, making, a, making a layup. Um, and that works on the kids changing kind of speeds because you're going 100% into that layup. But when you're going up for the layup, you need to slow down. Um, and be able to control your body at that point. So it's, you know, you're working on a few different things here. So the more that you can, um, as I said, put a couple different skills into one drill, the more fun it is for kids and the more they're getting out of it. And then here's some passing drills. Um, Reese, do you want me to try and show that video or should we just leave it? Um, you can just flick it. If you cop, can you copy the link and send it in the chat? Um, for some reason I cannot, um, but that's all right. We'll, I'll send it to everyone, um, after so that they can have a look at it. Yeah. Um, but a couple of different passing ones, um, you, you have your partner passing. Um, again, I like to give kids a bit of a challenge that yes, they need to be able to pass the ball back and forth to each other with one hand. You have your chest passes, your bounce passes, your overhead passes. Um, but it's a, it's a bit of fun for the kids when both partners have a ball and they have to learn to work together. So again, you're working on more than one thing at the same time and they don't even realize it. They're learning how to work together with their teammate and communicate when they're passing it at the same time. Um, so there's a different a couple different passes that you can work on um, with both of them having a basketball um, and again make it into a competition right once introduce it get them going tell them freeze now it's okay first to first to 10 first to 15 without dropping the ball um, it, it makes it a lot more competitive for the kids and they have a bit more fun with it than realizing they're just going through a skill um, and then a bit of movement with it i realize some of your practices might just be to half court and that's fine. Um, we could just cut that off at half court. This is a great drill to um, get kids moving while they're passing. So you have a partner and you're just shuffling, passing it back and forth, learning how to not travel with it as well. Um, working on a couple different passes there with the chest and the bounce and overhead. And then again, make it competitive, first team to finish wins. Um, and then with that veal passing series, it's really easy to transition into, you know, a three, um, three lane passing into two V one. And so just to walk through this, it's the exact same drill as you have here, but just with three lines, they're passing back and forth. And then the two at the end, they sprint back on defense. Um, and then you have this person, or actually, sorry, sorry. It's the person who shoots the layup sprints back on defense and the two wide, um, they're coming up for the 2v1. So it's a, a way to implement, yep, passing, all right, now straight into 2v1. Um, and the, obviously an important thing at the domestic level is kids learning how to shoot correctly. So before any of these drills, I normally have kids just kind of walk through some um, form shooting where they're just at the ring, they're working on set, load, release, just doing that form, um, not really doing any movement with it yet, just getting their hand um, motions correct and their foot pattern correct. Um, but this is a bit of a series where you can start off with three lines, just shooting off the catch, shoot it, get the rebound, pass it to the next person. Um, and then you go over here and you add a dribble into it. Um, it's really important though, like, and again, with all your drills, 
you're not just working on shooting right now, okay? You're working on shooting, following your shot, getting your rebound, and making a good pass back to your partner. So kids, kids will really focus on, yep, yeah, all I'm concerned with is shooting. They'll go get the ball and they'll just chuck it in the air back to, um, back to the next person in the line. Really try and um, hit home with it that it all, it all comes together in a lot of these drills. Hard flat passes back to your partner, sprint back in line. Um, the more game-like you can make things, the better. And then again, with that same series, you can do a spin-out series where um, they're tossing it to, uh, to themselves, going heel-toe um, up for their shot, putting, you know, implementing game-like situations. If you come off a screen, come off a curl, your inside foot plants first. Um, and a way to make that competitive is first team to 10 wins, rotate spots. And again, anytime you can make anything competitive, the better. Um, this last little drill here is one of my favorites. Um, the kids seem to really enjoy it. So it's lining up a bunch of cones in the middle of the court. And even if you only had a half court, you could still put them in the middle and just do two lines down here at the block or something like that. Um, but the kid shoots it. If he or she makes it, they dribble to go get their cone. They dribble it back, lay that cone on the baseline. If they miss it, they don't get a cone. So it's whoever, once all the cones are gone, whichever team has the most cones wins. Um, a rule that I have with it, if I see you at any point running to go get the cone, or if you pick up your dribble to get the cone, or if you run your cone back to the baseline without dribbling it, you've got to put it back. So, you know, it sounds, it sounds very um, simple, but it, you know, you'd be surprised a kid makes it and they just run and go get that cone. Okay, they just traveled. So again, anytime you can make your drills game-like, like, like you can't travel in a game, you can't travel in this drill. Um, the last one we'll kind of hit on is layups. As I was talking about before, the athletic development, I think is importantly, like especially important with your layup breakdown. Can kids jump off of one foot? Can they high jump off of one foot? Um, so I always introduce layups, no matter what the age, we always start out, no dribble, let me see your footwork. Okay, outside foot, inside foot, up. So starting at the block, no dribble, right, left, up. And obviously you need to be able to do both hands. So we'll do, say a minute on the right side, followed by a minute on the left side, and then we'll go back and we'll add in our dribble now. And it's funny, like as soon as you add in that dribble, kids just immediately overthink the footwork. Um, so the more time you can spend doing something as simple as a layup in your practice. Obviously you don't, as I mentioned before, don't spend too much time on it, um, but it's, it's something that's actually difficult for kids at this age to understand that footwork going full speed ahead and understanding you're going 100% to the basket, but once you get there, you need to be able to slow down. Because if you're going 100% the whole way, you're gonna brick the ball right off the backboard. Um, and then introducing some drills with it. So you have a three line layup drill, um, middle line passes, pass into your layup. So you're working again on your passing and then into your layup. So you're doing more than one thing. Um, this next one, chase down layups. It's a bit of a fun drill for the kids. It's a one-on-one -on -one drill. Um, so both kids are lined up here at the elbow. The coach will pass it to one of them and they've got to dribble in while whoever didn't get the ball needs to sprint um, and defend. So the, a big important point here is you're also working on defense. So that kid who's sprinting in to defend the ball, can they sprint their high hands, um, learning how to keep those hands up and not foul. And also learning how to make a layup now with defense and not just a wide open layup. And this is a very similar one, except you know there's no anticipation on who's going to be offense and defense. This um, line over here on the sideline is offense and the line at half court is defense. They'll make a sharp pass to um, the line on the sideline and they're gonna go in straight for a layup while the other person follows to defend it. And um, what, when you're introducing this drill, really important for this um, guy going in for the layup. Kids need to learn how to go somewhere with their dribble, how to not play around with the ball. You should be able to get from here to the ring in two to three dribbles. Okay, so that means you need to push the ball out. That doesn't mean you catch it, you take a few dribbles and then you go. So it really kind of works on getting straight to the ring as quickly 
in um, as fast as possible. And so that is all that I have there. Obviously, again, I could talk about skills and drills all day. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate. Um, that's all I've got. Thanks so much, Em. That was great. Great little um, overview of um, some things to consider when sort of teaching skills and creating your drills at the start and then some, some good examples. And uh, we'll make sure we get that out to the coaches on the follow-up email uh, tonight yeah. or tomorrow that's um, with some of that stuff and a link to um, yeah, those great videos of drills. They're all short, one, two minute sort of um, drills that you can grab out. You can use with your kids now, but certainly you can use them um, once you get back. And there's, there's three questions just to throw to you. So you're not done yet. Um, first one, the, on the layups, um, kids often on their dominant hand, which is usually their right hand, they're pretty comfortable and, and confident. Yep. And they move to that left side. They, um, not so good. How do you balance them wanting to make the shot in the practice versus demanding they use that left hand or that weak hand? Yeah, again, I mean, it's one of those things where repetition um, is very necessary. Um, you know, I obviously work on the strong hand, but it's then, look, guys, you know, basketball, you got to be able to play with both hands. We're going to go to the left side. And without a doubt, you get at least five moans and groans um, immediately. Um, but it's just it's just getting in those reps. You know, you, as as much positive feedback as you can give them, like, yeah, yeah, keep going, keep going. Really hard on the footwork because um, it's a different footwork than the right side. Um, instead of going right, left, left, right, I always say outside foot first, and it helps them a little bit. Um, yeah, they can they can resonate outside foot better than okay. What what's right and left? Yeah. Um, so yeah. I say outside foot, inside foot up. Um, I even sometimes will lay hula hoops out, so I'll get two hula hoops so they can see step step up. Um, and it, again, it's one of those things where you you can do it in practice, you can do it in practice, and then you introduce um, into a drill, and they're not going to go to the left. So it's it's what just repetitions really. Yeah, you, you made a really interesting point though. It's what you praise as a coach. You know, if you worry about whether it went in the hoop or not at a young age and yeah. they, they start to worry about that, it, whereas if you praise them for giving that best effort on that weekend, um, like you were talking about for that positive reinforcement, then you're going to really see um, some buy-in from the kid because they're getting, you know, good feedback and getting the yeah. attention for that. So it's, Even it's if it's good. positive feedback just about the footwork, like... Yeah. You know, you miss the shot, great job on the feet, the shot will come. Just yeah. simple stuff like that. Um, got one from, from Coach Adam on shooting. Um, what age would you start to really worry about their shot technique and their form shooting? Um, how, how old? I mean, you work with Aussie Hoops, you work with um, domestic development, so you've got that wide range. When would yeah. you start to really get into that form shooting? Um, oh, my feelings on it might be a bit different than others, but I think as soon as I can get a kid shooting right, the better. Um, obviously, the younger they are, the smaller ball they should be using, the lower ring that they should be using. The problem is when you're really trying to harp home um, shooting form to a six-year-old and they're using a size seven NBA ball, and they're, they're, they don't have the strength, they don't have, their hand is too small. Um, they're not going to be able to get the ball up even close to the ring. And so that's when the kids, they start forming bad habits. It's just, can I chuck it up there? I'm just going to use all my might to chuck it up there. Um, yeah, and then a lot of our Aussie hoops classes will take a hula hoop ring and we'll just use a hula hoop because it's not so much, can I get it up that high? It's, can I use the correct form? So honestly, I think form should be taught right away and it doesn't necessarily have to be at a ring, you know, you, there's a lot of different things that you can use. Uh, that's great, great. Um, and last one, uh, any suggestions for, for drills or ideas to teach footwork? Um, footwork, again, I think the ladders are a really big one. Um, I like to introduce a few obstacle courses with the kids where, you know, I've got ladders set up and then I've got hula hoops where they have to hop single leg and then out. Um, yeah. I'm happy to attach one of those um, examples into an email that we send out. Yep. Um, but yeah, I would definitely say invest in some ladders, invest in some cones. You know, it's, it's 
even setting cones up in a straight line and then getting kids to run and weave in and out of those cones. Do it without a ball, now add a ball. Um, simple stuff like that. We've got a last minute question, Em. Yeah, all good. Uh, <laughs> how do you, from, from Chris, he said, how do you break uh, bad shooting habits for an under 16s athlete? we probably <laughs> a couple of years of some, some bad habits. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think kids, especially at that age, um, not to, you know, bring it down at that age, but they, uh, you know, you kind of think you know everything. Um, so I think video footage is, um, especially for that age, the perfect um, yeah. weapon to show them, you know, no, you're not doing it right. Have a look. Um, so if you can film them shooting a shot, show them in slow motion and have them see it, um, I think right there is where you can make a huge um, starting point at least to where, ah, oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, and then give them examples of how to correct it and go from there. Again, uh, you know, nothing's fixed overnight. You still can do form shooting and then you get into a game and you're going to go right back to your old habits for a while, but that's why you continue to practice it. Yeah, brilliant answer. I think um, I think the the use of video, particularly with those older kids, is in, imperative because they might think their shot looks like an NBA player in their head, but if you actually yeah. show it and it looks like rubbish, they yeah. might you might be able to correct some of that and yeah. get them back into that stuff. So I think that's a really good way because otherwise they they may not believe you. Um, there has been one more people are getting. Oh, good. I might uh, get this one through later, but because I want to roll into Billy's room a little bit over time, which believe it or not, Emily promised you, you promised you wouldn't be over time. But I thought it was pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, thanks so much for that though, Emily. That was awesome. I'll Thank now you. introduce Billy Akalo, Akalo, sorry. I'm learning to say it right. Um, Billy uh, is going to present on man-to-man -man defense. So I'll throw to you now, coach. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, we got you, man. Awesome, beautiful. So, man-to-man -man defense, a big topic. Uh, I hope I do my very best to uh, show you everything about it. Can everyone see my screen? I hope everyone does. Yes. All right, let's get it started. Beautiful. All right. Man-to-man -man defense. So, um, usually in domestic, um, it is a bit sporadic. <laughs> At times, uh, you do see teams uh, apply good man-to-man. -man. Other times, you don't. Hopefully, you get a good rundown on how to run a good man-to-man. -man. Um, it is pretty basic, but I will try my very best to explain everything. Um, so, pillars of team defense. So, I've got two great quotes that sort of sum summarize what I believe in in explaining team defense, and it starts with effort and, effort and encouragement. Michael Haynes, who I believe is a rugby coach, says it pretty well. Um, the best defensive technique will fail if a team does not communicate effectively. A team with no defensive technique but playing with heart can still succeed if the team communicates effectively. Successful defense is an attitude more than technique. I think um, in terms of technique, in terms of what you teach defensively, if your team doesn't have any heart and effort, in applying these techniques, I think everything's thrown out of the door. Um, so it's all about preaching the effort and encouraging and encouraging them to have that effort to execute, um, to communicate, um, and to apply the proper technique in man-to-man um, -man defense. Um, coach K, who's the um, head coach for the University of Duke, um, says it pretty well about communication. Communication does not always come naturally, even amongst a tight-knit group of individuals, like friendship groups um, consist mostly in um, domestic teams. So just because they're tight-knit doesn't mean they are all in it playing defense. Um, communication must be taught and practiced in order to bring everyone together as one. So it's all about what type of communication you're using. Um, so again, just alluding to the, the other three pillars, um, your effort and encouragement, create an environment where your players are engaged and empowered to make decisions, drive, this um, drive the environment with encouragement and care. So if you come in as a coach with a caring attitude, they usually got to care back and invest back defensively. Um, your communication and direction, um, your comms or your communication or 
should always specify the background. So if we're talking about, for example, half court defense, we should talk about the half court, um, a phrase that connects to the situation. So for example, we might be in a half court and we're talking about our help defense. All right. And then maybe we're talking about our closeouts. Um, so always specify your type of communication and your context and what the action can, and technique connects to that. And make sure, and, and this is probably one of the bigger points is hold them accountable. Um, it doesn't mean yank them off. Um, it's just meaning, you know, just let them know that, you know, they might be doing well in some aspects of the defense. They might be closing out well, but maybe they're not shuffling their feet. Maybe they got too, too high hands above the ball, but they haven't slid their feet enough to get a chest fly. So something like that. And I think feedback's really important. Um, the language that you use to describe what's happening um, in your man-to-man is important. So, and it usually follows uh, these characteristics. So it's usually coaches use a descriptive word. So um, basically ball. So when we're picking up in transition defense, um, the players close to the ball will call out ball. Um, it's important that we tell our players what type of language we're using. Um, so it might be ball, it might be a, a certain uh, animal or, or you have some sort of language that you use and describe things in the game. Um, and it connects to them. And if it connects to them, they might buy into it, especially with the young kids. Um, the use of analogies is really good as well. So when we're talking about a help defense, um, instead, of an, instead of saying um, help spot, maybe describe as a gap because the gap is actually the to, um, is a, is the position that the defender is between the two opponents. Um, it might be action orientated. So, for example, it's about um, hands up. You know, so hand above the ball at all times. Um, boxing out. So box out. So that sort of thing. And monosyllabic. So keep it to one word. And especially in game day where you you have certain points of emphasis, uh, it's really important to keep your words and phrases and dot points and sound bites. Because in a timeout, in a, uh, in a practice, um, you shouldn't be talking in paragraphs. You should be telling bedtime stories. Um, your language and the use of language is in dot points and sound bites. So they have more time in, in training and less time of you talking. All right. So it's more efficient communication. Uh, let's just go through the skills. So what I believe um, in on-ball defense, on the catch, oh, sorry, it's in three phases. So before the catch, during the catch, and after the catch. This is just for an on-ball defender. Before the catch, um, if you're a deny one pass away coach, which I will talk about later on, or you're in an open stance, um, you've got to make sure that you are looking big. So having your arms out, um, and I usually use a lot of metaphors and similes. So for younger kids, I go, have your arms out like scarecrows. All right, they might not know what a scarecrow is, but you might use something that they know and they, they can connect to. Um, and in your stance, obviously, you know, feet wider, feet as wide as you can and in a good base. So pretty much uh, in the cylinder, shoulder width apart. Um, your vision, obviously maintain your triangles. And we'll talk about that later in the presentation. And we'll also talk about the shrink spots and denying a player. During your catch, this is when the ball is coming towards you, um, towards your opponent, and now you're guarding the ball. It's really important to apply pressure on the ball. This disrupts players' vision. This also disrupts players' timing and space. And basketball is a game of opposites. So if a player wants uh, space, we want to do the opposite and minimize space and take away space. So... One way to minimize space is to have a hand above the ball. So then if they are passing the ball, the hand's above it and we can deflect passes. It's really important to sprint to the closeout to space. Um, be space takers, all right? Um, offense wants to be space makers. So that's, a, that's an analogy. Um, and arrive to the ball balance. So nose behind your toes. You know, if you're closing out to the ball, your nose is in front of your toes. You've got to be off balance. Um, and most of the time it's going to be blow by. Um, and obviously, after the catch, you're applying ball pressure. Your containment is all about multiple efforts. It's not a single effort. Just because you close out doesn't mean your defensive uh, job is done. You have to contain the ball. And it all goes back to what 
Emily said before in the previous presentation is about that skill development and investing your time in practice to teach these skills and in closing out and having the hand above the ball and sliding their feet um, and containing the ball. Uh, one of the things I talk about when guarding the ball in a man to man situation is having the bum to, bum to bucket. So in other words, having your back face in the basket so you're squared and you're not given a, a high foot. Usually offensive players want to attack a higher foot. So let's say, for example, we're on the right side of the floor. You know, if our right foot's higher, they want to attack that and open you up. Um, one of the great sayings is uh, if you open up, you give up. So you try not to open the gate. Keep bum to basket and keep them in front of you. Let's go to the next one. Hopefully the video comes up well, but this is what I thought was um, some great containment. Um, just stole it from YouTube. So if it comes choppy, my apologies. So, I, you know, we'll see how we go with it. Um, how's that looking? Hopefully that's okay. I'll just pause it at certain points. So again, bum to basket. If you just see my mouse, his bum is almost facing the basket. He's having his chest to chest. Um, he's just bumped the play. He's established a good defensive position. His hands are up. Again, it's a multiple effort. So again, he's keeping in front, trying to keep in front. His hands are high. He's not fouling. All right. So, and that's one of the most important things in defense. It's probably the most frustrating things as a coach, seeing a, uh, a defender doing so good in three, four seconds of containing the ball and seeing a foul. And us on the sideline going, oh my God, it's a foul. You know, that's so bad. So it's, it's, <laughs> It's frustrating, but if you can teach those skills from walling up, sliding feet, to having hand above the ball, uh, that's got to take you a long way of creating good man-to-man -man, uh, defense. Basic principles off the ball. So we've just gone through on the ball defense and talking about how to guard the ball and the different situations in guarding the ball. Um, now we're just about talking about now the off ball principles. So there's two situations you're in if you're not guarding the ball, you're either in an open stance. So for example, where's my mouse? I can't find it. Uh, yeah, so for example, um, you've got your gap, your open stance. Um, if you imagine the basket is uh, just, um, just on the side there, um, they're usually in the gap protecting the, the ball carrier and attacking the, the gap. Or you've got a denial stance where you're denying your player from getting the ball. Um, there's usually um, different situations with uh, having these two um, sort of principles. You know, if you're open sort of stance, um, oppositions are usually prone to attacking the rim. So maybe you want to play in that open stance. Uh, whereas if you're a denial stance, there might be a, just a super duper great uh, domestic player. <laughs> Uh, that's just dominating your league and your competition, you might be want to, you want to deny that player. All right, so I think it's really important to teach those two principles of off-ball defense, teaching that gap defense, looking like a scarecrow, having your hands up, looking big, so then the, so then the player with the ball doesn't see space. Man-to-man uh, -man is all about five players guarding the ball. So it's important, again, to take away time and space for the ball carrier to attack the paint, get a paint touch and correct for, for the, his teammates. Or you've got the denial stance where you can just deny the ball off a certain great player in your domestic league. Um, I've, I've seen plenty in my time in coaching domestic and it does get frustrating to see a player score 40 or 30. Um, but yeah, you want to sort of explore those two options as a team defense. Um, as you're off the ball, it's really important that every time the ball is passed um, that you are jumping to the ball. Okay, so one of the consequences of not jumping to the ball and jumping back is, you know, if you see on um, the second uh, diagram on the right-hand side, you usually allow a basket cut or face cut, as they call it. So it's important that we jump to the ball, so we take away that face cut. So as you can see on the second diagram, number four is um, doing a face cut because X4, or defender four, is jumping back instead of jumping to the ball and jumping to the side. So the player should be jumping to the left. So the number four has been uh, negated and will then cut away. So again, it's important to always jump to the ball. Um, distance from opponent, and this is something I just want you just to 
remember as we go through this presentation, if you're one pass away, so in the, um, the diagram just below um, on the slide on the bottom left hand corner, um, if you're one pass away, you're in the black, so you're basically defender three and defender two. Um, if you're two passes away, you're defender four. If you're three passes away, you're defender five. So with the one pass away, you're either in a, like I said in the previous slide, in a denial stance or in an open stance. So number two might be a great player. So we might just deny that player and force the ball to go to the right side of the floor. That's one example. Another example is number one who has the ball just there um, is a great person that attacks off the dribble and gets to the paint. So we might want to play an open stance. So number two and number three might play an open stance. Number one can't see space and then has to pass the ball around. All right. Uh, or you can just deny number three and number two because number one can't dribble. So number one really can't dribble, can't create. We deny number three and number two. We apply pressure uh, and that might create turnovers. If we go to the next one. So hopefully this video goes through, but this is sort of a demonstration of how we move from one pass away to two pass away and how we rotate as a defense. So again, um, hopefully that appears well on the screen, but players are playing a denial stance or open stance and moving as the ball moves, they move. So as the ball's in the air, the defenders are in the air. All right, and then take away time and space for the ball. I'll just play that again. So again, players are in the gap or denying, the moving as the ball is moved, they're chopping their feet. Um, and if you can see one point, um, I'll play it again. So the defender's feet is wider than the offensive player's foot feet. So feet wider than feet, the hands are above the ball. Um, you can see the play on the left wing that they're being denied. The other players sort of play in an open stance, but kind of playing, applying some pressure on the passing lane. Um, you see the player who's two passes away on the split line. We'll talk about that um, later on. We'll just keep on going through. Um, again, um, your defense starts on the rebound and, and on the change of possession. So accordingly, two, there's sort of two um, things that players should be doing on your shot. Either they should be running to the rebound or running back to guard your basket. They shouldn't be in no man's land where they're basically between the three point lines, right? So they're either committing to the rebounds or they're committing to the basket, to the, um, the opponent's basket. So it's up to you as a coach what you do. Um, what I do is um, on a domestic, uh, so on a Saturday, um, I usually have opposition teams play a lot of run and gun and they love attacking in transition. So I send four plays back and only have my big uh, crashing for the rebounds. There'll be other times when my team is big and I, I might send three or four to the glass so that I can get an extra possession. All right. So again, coaches may designate specific roles for players or simply send the amount of players that they need to for either the rebound or transition. Um, in the second slide or the second diagram on the right, you can see the X2 contesting the outlet. So again, applying pressure on the pass um, and then getting organized. So it's all about your communication behind the ball, someone declaring the ball, someone declaring basket, all right? and having that common language that all the players can understand it. And again, that just, just demonstrated in the diagram one on the left, that number two is committed to the ball. Um, it's someone's committing to the basket. You should only commit to the ball and, un, until someone commits to the basket. So it's basket first, then ball, then you want to guard one pass away. Okay, so I call this the safety position. Um, someone call it, some people call it deep. It just depends on what language that you use. Um, and in a three on two, which is usually the situation that happens domestic, um, you do want to um, play in a tandem or in an I formation, covering the top of the key in the basket. Your main objective in transition is to stop an out, to stop a layup, right? So you're trying to slow down the offense to uh, create a layup. So it's all about your rotations from the bottom I or X3 rotating to two. Um, you see in diagram two and number one dropping down. 
Um, and it's just slowing down, so then slowing the offense down, sorry. So then you get um, your teammates back to have five players guarding five. And that's what you want in your transition defense. Um, I'll just go through quickly some, with some drill ideas. Hopefully, um, I go through every aspect of uh, your man to man. Um, the first one is just the Tibbs drill. And, and again, I'll, I'll send this through to Reese and uh, through the. Um, through the channels, just you, you can uh, collect these drills. Uh, this is just a closeout drill, um, half court. So basically, everyone has a ball on the perimeter. Um, coach, I didn't have coach on uh, on the screen, but you can just have the coach in the half court circle. Um, there should be pitter pattering, so hot feet, foot fire, I call it. Um, on the coach's slap of the basketball, um, then they um, slap hands or give a high five. All right, and then, then they guard the ball. So all of them are guarding the ball, having two high hands above the ball, feet wider than feet, feet wider than feet, um, and you're going through it from there. If you look at the bottom two um, diagrams, you can just see there's um, an extra series. So for example, you might add two dribbles. So then the players on the perimeter with the circles around their numbers just take a dribble to the left or right. So then we're focusing on the multiple efforts, um, the the closeout, feet wider than feet, sprinting to the closeout, and then having um, your players and dribbling to a certain direction and having the defenders contain the ball. So that's one drill. This is one of my favorite drills of mine. Um, the blue circles can represent anything. They can be a chair. They can be a spot on the floor that you say. Um, it could be anything. But what you're trying to do is force the, the defense, sorry, force the offensive player to the red lines, all right? So you're trying to force the red, to force them to the red. Um, the objective for the offensive player is to get to the blue, okay? So offensively, you want to get into the middle. You want to get into the paint. De defense, you want to force them outside the middle of the floor. So it gives them a visual representation of stopping middle penetration or middle drives to the basket, um, so it's sort of a good way for kids to understand that. Um, and it gets pretty competitive. So try to move your spots away from that center bit so, because you can get collisions. Um, I've had that a couple of times. <laughs> so just from trial and error, you just want to move those spots a bit back. Um, but you're, again, your objective is to force them away and force them to the sideline. Um, pretty common drill that you've seen in, in YouTube clips and in um, coach education videos and um, courses, uh, the, the simple zigzag drill, um, it does the job. Um, again, you can have your, your first series, like in the bottom diagram, you can just basically do zigzag footwork, slide your feet. Um, and then in your second uh, series, you can add a defender. Once they reach the half court line, then they, they can go one on one and, ta and attack. Um, again, correct stance, low and wide the whole time. Don't lead forward. Um, have your correct footwork. So again, big to bigger. Do not bring your feet together. Uh, that's a recipe for disaster. Navy drill. Um, I know that some coaches do struggle in transition defense um, because we are limited to um, half court most of the time. This is something I experience. So one way to sort of uh, um, simulate a transition is to, um, I use this drill, Navy drill. Um, so basically you've got your offensive players on the half court line. Uh, you have your defensive players um, just online with you. Um, coach makes a pass to one of the players on the uh, half court line. The player that they're facing, or the defender that, or oh, sorry, so let's say for example number three, um, we pass to number three. His partner has to touch the half court line, and then as you can see in the second slot of uh, the second diagram to the right, that's when you get the numerical disadvantage. Uh, for the defense. So we get a momentary four on three. Um, and then from there, you just give those players the opportunity to uh, uh, attack the basket offensively. So two-way teach here. So teach the offense as well. You know, good offense, you know, can push good defense. So make sure you're teaching high and wide spacing, spread the floor, attack the middle. Um, defensively, again, focus on your communication, keep your language simple stop the ball, get someone to the basket and communicate who you want, all right? And establish um, even advantage, or sorry, even numbers. So three on three, four on four. Again, you can use five on five, you can go four on four, even three on three. So 
if you go three on three, can put a lot of pressure on the uh, on the uh, defense. Um, and again, just the last slide, just closeouts, simple closeouts. Um, I am wary of time, so I will um, just let you guys look at it for a second. Again, uh, I'll make this available for for Reese and for you guys to have a look. Um, and thank you, much appreciated. Thanks, Billy. Good work, mate. And clearly uh, a lot of time put into that. So thank you for that. And uh, I'm sure the coaches will get plenty uh, from that and be able to go back and um, pick little bits and um, add that in with their team. Um, Barry, do you want to ask your question direct? Just because there's a bit of detail in there, mate, if you want to unmute and, and ask your question. Barry? Oh. Yep, now I've got you. <laughs> yeah, no, I've got you now. I just thought it'd be easier if you ask. No, you're right. Um, yeah, here you going, Billy. Hi, Barry. How are you? Good, good. I think you know where I'm coming from. Of course. Of course. <laughs> uh, no, good, good presentation. Enjoyed it. Um, you spoke about having heart as, say, defender. Um, I agree. Yeah, you, you've really got to go out there and, and grind and be hard. Yeah. What I've learned over the years. Um, not only on offence, but defence, more importantly, that technique is quite big. Correct yep. hand positioning, correct footwork, and all that sort of stuff. Um, how much emphasis do you as a coach place on um, correcting bad technique? Because my feel on it is, if you have a, uh, an above average to good ball handler and someone who's bad form on defence, that's a terrible mix. Yeah. Uh, great question. Um, again, I... I focusing on what I presented, uh, every part of your individual defense and your man to man is important. So it's efforts important as well as technique. I think they go hand in hand. Um, I think significant time should be invested. So I, I just use my team as an example in, in a 60 minute practice in an hour practice, I would spend half an hour on it. Um, and it's not like we're focusing really on defense or like exclusively on defense. I'll just two-way teach it. So, for example, it might be a small-sided game. Um, I might be focusing on closeouts um, and might be really um, uh, focusing on hand pressure, um, containing the ball, um, staying in front and not allowing blow-bys. So um, it just depends. Um, but... Again, it's all about that mix um, and not exclusively focusing on offense or not exclusively focus on defense. You've got to have a good balance. And what Emily said previously, I think was fantastic. Um, using small sided games does give coaches the opportunity to teach both sides of the ball. Um, and I think um, if you're going uh, two on two, three on three, three on three, four on four, you might have a, have a dedicated 10 minutes where you're focusing on help defense. You might be focusing on your split line. Um, so again, it's just picking and choosing, but it's having the practice plans being organized um, and obviously dedicating um, significant mm -hmm. amount of time, not just on the team defense, but I think the skill, the skills are really important. Yes, yeah, yeah, no, good, good. Thanks, Bill. No worries. Thanks for that. Um, there hasn't been anything else come through, Billy, so you, you might get a bit of an early mark and we'll keep to <laughs> time. But, uh, um, yeah, thanks so much for that, mate. That was really good. And um, if you're happy to, we'll send out your presentation as well. Uh, if the coaches want to review and then maybe they might have something they want to follow up with after or something like that, a question, you know, and we can um, we can get that answered somehow. So, um Thanks to everyone, obviously Emily and Billy in particular for, for putting those detailed presentations together. They were awesome. Um, so really a lot of work goes into that. It's not a five minute job. It's a five day job to, to put one of these together. So I know that the, the time and work that you guys put in and we can see that tonight. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, thanks to all the coaches for tuning in. And if there is anything you want to follow up on afterwards when we send the email out, uh, let us know and we can follow up with, uh, with the coach. Next week, um, we're, we're rolling again uh, on the Monday night, um, end of the long weekend with um, Jess Scannell and, and Corey 
Michelides, so uh, should be some, some good stuff. Jess is going to present on um, inclusive coaching, uh, which would be really interesting and a really important topic for us to consider uh, at this time of how you can be uh, more inclusive and engaging um, of all different um, challenges that kids might face. And then um, Corey's going to talk about sort of in-game coaching, which would be good because often uh, underrated uh, aspect of, of sort of coach development. So thanks so much and hope to see you guys um, there again. Thanks.